Yes, sir, we are live now. Yeah. Good evening, all. I am Prashant Agrawal, Associate Director with MQ. I welcome you for uh, 12th month of No Thrombosis Workshop Series in Acute Ischemic Stroke. Today, we have uh, Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan, sir, as our post director, and Dr. S. Minakshi Sundaram and Dr. K. Vijayan as our moderator. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our extreme faculty for the evening. Uh, I take this opportunity to introduce Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan. He is Director and Professor at Institute of Neurology at Madras Medical Mission. Dr. Narsimhan is active member and international advisor of academic, uh, American Academy of Neurology, executive member of World Federation of Neurology for second term. He is the licensing member of WHO on Neurological Policies, founder member of South Asian Cochrane Network and Advocacy Wing in IAN. Best Scientist Teacher, Doctor's Award with, from prestigious institutes he has received globally. Editor of multiple textbooks, journals in neurology and editor of Cochrane Epilepsy Group. Sir is State Nodal Officer for Script, which is run in state government and uh, it has collaboration with 23 hubs and 33 spokes. Sir has organized exclusive stroke ICU in MMC and organized exclusive neurorespiratory ICU in RGDH and MMC. Welcome you on board, sir, for the evening. I take, this opportunity, I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. S. Minakshi Pundram. Sir is con Senior Consultant in Neurology at Apollo Hospital, Madurai. Dr. Minakshi Sundram, sir, has over 20 years of experience in neurology and presented papers at various prestigious national and international forums. Sir is recipient of Best Research Paper Award at the 10th Annual Congress of Indian Academy of Neurology. He is principal investigator for many international trials such as refractory partial epilepsy, stroke, acute stroke intervention trial, and PD trial. Sir is editor of South Asian edition of Book Practical Neurology by George Pillar, published by Walter Clover, uh, December 20, and also contributed to many books on neurology. Welcome you on board, sir, for the evening. We also have our second moderator for the evening, Dr. Krishnan Vijayan. He is consultant neurology and neurosonologist at Royal Care Super Specialty Hospital, Coimbatore. Sir has participated and presented papers on ischemic strokes at World Congress of Neurology at Sydney. He is principal investigator in phase three trials like PD patients, hyponatremia, multiple sclerosis, chronic neuropathic back pain, diabetic neuropathy, post herpetic neurology, and his plasticity. Welcome you on board, sir. I take this opportunity to, well, to introduce speakers for the day. Dr. R. Srivartan will be our first speaker. Sir is Associate Consultant at Neurology, MGM Healthcare, Chennai. Sir has a various multiple academic achievements, including All India ranked number two in NIHS Super Specialty Neurology in 2018. And he is the national finalist for Torrent Young Scholar Award Neurology 21. He has presented multiple papers, poster presentations at national and international conferences, and has various publications in peer-reviewed journal and index journals. Contributed authors for multiple books as well. Welcome you on board, sir, for the evening. I take this opportunity to introduce our second speaker for the evening, Dr. Dinesh Mohan Chaudhary. He is consultant neurology at Indraprast Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. He has a special area of interest in stroke and vascular neurology and Botox. Various multiple international research presentations he had on his uh, uh, various multiple international research presentations he has on his name. More than 80 nationals and international publications with multiple chapters and books. Review of four prestigious journals multiple best research paper awards across national and international CMEs, and he is the co-investigator for multiple research trials as well. Welcome you on board, sir. With this, I take this opportunity to hand over session to Dr. Lakshmi Narsimhan, sir, and request for him to take forward the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And uh, I, I thank Dr. Meenakshi, is my younger brother, 
hailing from the goddess city of Meenakshi's uh, city of Madurai. I'm very happy to be associated with this no thrombosis program. It's the first time I'm taking part in this. And I'm very extremely happy this Dr. Srivardhan, one of our uh, alumnus of our Institute of Neurology is also presenting. I'm also keen, looking forward to see what Dr. Dinesh is going to present on the tough calls on the thrombosis. And I now hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Meenakshi Sundaram for further taking over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I call Lakshmi Rasan sir only as my brother. He is a more than a brother to me. And in fact, the Walter Kluwer's book, which you have mentioned, he is the main editor. I'm only a sub-editor of that. So he is the one who has given a lot of chances to people like us. And Shivadhan is part of our group. Shivadhan may be presenting here. Shivadhan is actually a guru to me. Welcome, Shivadhan, on board. And welcome, Dr. Mohan. We are excited to listen to you. As Dr. Subhash Tolzer used to say in this forum, he used to say that, you know, RCTs will give us a lot of information. But for managing an individual case, you need to go through some case reports. And individual cases is what is going to guide you. On this occasion, I am happy to welcome Dr. Shivadhan to come forward with this first case. Shivadhan, the platform yours. Thank you very much again for joining Lakshmi Sarana. Thank you. Sir, is my screen visible? Yes, sir, visible, sir. Yeah. Uh, at the outset, I thank my mentors, Dr. Lakshman Simon and Dr. Minakya Sindram and the MQ for giving this opportunity. So I'll directly go to the case which I'm going to present today. Sir, the patient was, is a, sir, would you like to start your video so that it will be visible there? Yes. Yeah. So the patient which I'm presenting today is a 63-year-old female. She is a known case of diabetes and hypertension for the last 10 years. She is on regular oral medications with a FAR control. And the HbA1c done a month prior to the symptom onset was 7.1. She presented with an acute onset of left upper limb, lower limb weakness with facial deviation and slitting of speech. And she presented to ER within an hour of symptom onset. On examination at initial assessment, the vitals are stable. The BP was 170 by 100. CBG was 198 milligram per deciliter. She had a left hemiparesis with left facial palsy and left sensory intervention. Her NHSS was 9. And this was a plain CT brain, which almost had a normal CT. The aspect was almost 9 with a dense right MCA sign. Patient had no obvious contraindication for thrombolysis. And injection tenecta place 0.5 mg per kg IV was given as a bonus dose. And the patient was taken for a CT angio to rule out a large vessel occlusion as per our institutional protocol. This is the CT angiography source image, which shows a normal left MCA, while there is an abrupt cutoff of the right M1 segment of the right middle cerebral artery. And this is the MIP reconstructed images, which shows a proximal M1 occlusion. So the patient was planned for an endovascular intervention in the form of mechanical thrombectomy. And this is the angio image, the DSA image prior to thrombectomy, which shows a filling defect in the M1 segment. And this is after the successful mechanical thrombectomy, TC grade 3 flow was achieved at the end of two passes. Within the next 24 hours, her deficit significantly improved. And her NHSS improved from a score of 9 to 3. At discharge, she only had a minimal left upper limb drift and all her activities of daily living were unaffected. She was discharged on dual antiplatelets and again by institutional protocol, we give ticagrelor for all patients who undergo endovascular intervention. So she received aspirin 150 mg and ticagrelor 90 mg twice a day and she was started on rosvastatin 40 mg per day. However, a month later, the patient presented with around six episodes of transient numbness and weakness involving the left arm and face. And she dropped objects because of this transient numbness and weakness. She was brought to us with these complaints. Examination revealed only the minimal left pronator drift with no fresh neurological deficits and her NHSS was one. So we directly did an MRI. MRI brain showed few small acute infarcts in the right corner radiator. And MR angio again showed an occlusion at the same segment where the thrombectomy was done and recanalization was achieved. 
So a CT angiography was repeated. And this is the MAP image, which shows occlusion of the right M1 segment exactly at the same place where we did a mechanical thrombectomy. So what mix to do? The BP and sugar control were optimal. There was no evidence of any obvious prothrombotic state. There are uh, other evaluation for prothrombotic state like vitamin B12 and homocysteine was normal. We even ruled out an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. We also ended up doing a platelet study. This is the platelet inhibition with arachnoidic acid to assess the aspirin efficacy. And this is the platelet inhibition with ADP to assess ticagrelor efficacy. And the platelet inhibition was sufficient, meaning the patient had no obvious resistance to any of the antiplatelet agents given. So we followed almost all the standard ICAT protocol of secondary prevention. The LDL cholesterol was 63. The systolic BP was well maintained. Antiplatelet resistance was ruled out. Potential prothrombotic disorders were ruled out. And the glycemic control was better. It improved from 7.1 to 6.5. However, since the patient continued to have recurrent episodes of TA like events with MRA showing fresh infarcts and angio showing vessel restenosis, the patient was explained for the need of intervention. And in this case, intracranial ICH stenting. So again, the patient was taken for DSA. This is the DSA showing significant stenosis of the right M1 segment. And an intracranial stent was placed. And this is the CT image after the procedure showing the stent. And uh, we followed the latest ESO guidelines, which recommends maintaining an LDL cholesterol less than 55 and to achieve that SATMEB was added in addition to rosuvastatin. But two months later, patient again came with similar complaints, multiple episodes of transient numbness and weakness involving the left arm and face. This is the MRI repeated again, which showed multiple new infarcts over the coronary radiator on the right side, as well as over the cortex. And MR angiography showed stenosis or lack of flow in the entire area, which was stented. So this was the DSA image where you can clearly see that the entire stented region of the M1 has undergone a restenosis. So this qualifies as a symptomatic instant restenosis in spite of the best medical management and compliance to dual antiplatelet therapy. So following extensive discussions with the family, a decision was taken to proceed towards angioplasty for the instant restenosis. We even considered options for any drug eluting stents, but then the role of drug eluting stents for intracranial ICAD is not well established and the safety is not clearly known. So this is the final DSA image showing the stent stenosis and an angioplasty was performed to open up the stenosis. Following this procedure, the patient had a very small uh, sim uh, reperfusion related uh, MRH. However, the patient had only a minimal leg take and had no significant symptoms and she recovered well. And over the last two to three months where she has been under our follow-up, patient has not had any further symptoms. The main points of discussion at the end of this case are three questions. The question number one was what could have been done better to prevent all these complications from happening? The second question is, what is the literature evidence for management of intracranial atherosclerotic disease? And the third question is, what predisposed our patient to develop such recurrent stenosis of the same vessel? There was no evidence of any atherosclerotic occlusions of other major intracranial vessels or evidence of atherosclerosis affecting the large vessels elsewhere in the body. So to summarize the management of ICAT, it can be medical interventional in the form of surgical or endovascular therapy. This is the latest uh, European Stroke Organization's recommendation published in June 3, 2022 for management of ICAT, where they recommend mechanical thrombectomy, but the role of angioplasty or stenting is not well established. Again, they recommend using dual antiplatelets for a minimum period of 90 days. And they have a strong recommendations against any kind of intervention, be it angioplasty or stenting, or be it any neurosurgical intervention like a bypass procedure. However, the expert consensus states that 
Endovascular treatment can be considered as a rescue therapy in selected patients with symptomatic high-grade intracranial atherosclerotic stenosis after clinical recurrence despite best medical treatment like our patient. And coming to secondary prevention, this is the latest guidelines from ESO which recommends an LDL to be maintained as less than 55 and they suggest adding EZMEP in addition to the high dose HMG CoA reductase inhibitors even if the LDL is not controlled at the end of six weeks. So almost all these recommendations were followed for our patient. And the recommendations for endovascular intervention primarily comes from the SAMPRES trial where the benefit of best medical treatment was shown over endovascular therapy. And the biggest concerns for endovascular therapy was the very high periprocedural cardiac complications. And the major drawbacks of the SAMPRES trial was there was a question about the expertise of the investigators and the choice of stent, which was wingspan. Interestingly, this is a study which has compared all the various studies for intracranial atherosclerotic stenting, where it was found only in SAMPRES, the periprocedural complications were close to 14 to 15%, while all the other studies, some of them even which used a wingspan, had a reasonably good periprocedural complications. These three trials, which I marked in the red boxes, VASIT, SAMPRES, and COS, recommends best medical management for intracranial atherosclerotic disease. And it has been shown that in all these trials, the one year stroke and death rate is close to 15 to 20%. While the trials which have evaluated intervention for endovascular therapy in the form of endovascular therapy for ICAT have shown a relatively lower death and stroke recurrence at the end of one year which is almost 50% of what we are seeing with best medical management. And these are two interesting papers, which I found out at the end of this case to study about the symptomatic intracranial atherosclerotic stenosis. And I'll just give the gist of this. It is mentioned that up to 15% of patients who undergo intracranial stenting develop instant stenosis of which 28.8% are symptomatic with new or recurrent ischemic events. Several factors like age, diabetes mellitus, the type of stent, and the lesion location are believed to contribute. Also, interestingly, there is a smoker's paradox which mentions that people who smoke are less likely to develop an instant stenosis. Similarly, women are more prone to develop instant stenosis compared to men. So, so I want to uh, the moderators to give their opinion as to what could have been done better for this particular patient, sir. First, the LMM has to speak. No, oh, um, no, no. Um, uh, Meenakshi, you finish. Anna, I'll, 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 I'll talk at the end. Just yeah. That's a great case. Uh, it was like uh, sitting through a movie. Uh, you see, fantastic, really. I mean, it was very thrilling to see that. So the initial part was that it was a success story with connected place. Thank you very much. And the dose you chose was 0.25, right? So yes, a little deviation from our Indian recommendations, but we are also following only 0.25. So though the recommendation from MQR is to use 0.2, that is their leaflet. And that is what the DCGA has actually recommended. But we have found that 0.25 is more effective as we over to 0.25 especially after the publication of the ACT trial from Canada. Mm -hmm. We are going through only 0.25 now. That's a real good uh, thing for us. So it really works. And the patient was okay. The proof of pudding was that the patient had become much better. And after that, you had to do a, a procedure there. Thrombectomy. Because it was a large vessel occlusive disease. And the patient definitely underwent that bridging and did well. Now, uh, just one interviewing question because Frankly speaking, we are not doing integral integral intervention at all. We are not done. And I remember in those very old days, even before these things were actually in the market, I'm talking about the 1997 years, 98, 99, 2000, nothing was talked about at that. Even at that time, Professor Jack Mercer, I remember, was doing it, but I do not know whether it was really successful. Intergranial uniformly has not been successful. We are not doing at all, especially after the publication of the SAMP trial, we have gone away from that. And after that, there was one another trial which was started and then given up. That was a visit trial. Again, you know, it was stopped. 
the weave yes. data which you showed actually was actually PMS, if I am right. It was not a study. Yes, sir. It was study. a PMS. They mean people who were dropped out, they decided they will go over with the weave. Otherwise, it was not a study at all. So it is really interesting to see. And the reason why they don't accept this, one of the main reasons, because as you showed in your case also, more than 50% stenosis rate. This yes. stenosis happens in more, and you have the problem of dissection. And overall, they saw that, you know, uh, you, you'll have better results with best medical therapy. Okay. Here, how you could have worked. Just an intriguing question. If we had left the patient alone, what would have happened, in your opinion? Because those strokes subsequently happened were very small strokes. No? Only there was a stent in place. Could you have just sir, left it? Left? Yes, sir. that was our issue. But uh, on the single day, she had six episodes of PAE after the successful thrombectomy. And the DSA showed a significant uh, stenosis of that particular segment of M1. Our only concern was what if she develops a significant M1 occlusion and ends up becoming a malignant MCA infarction. Not only that, that was a fear. He is in a corporate setup where he's. I am really surprised by his convincing capacities for such a wonderful. <laughs> you know, you could see the number of times they were able to intervene in spite of everything. So yes, sir. So anyhow, I really appreciate that. I could understand. Yeah, I am really uh, overwhelmed by the uh, fact that you have got the. Such a good convincing capacity of a patient for uh, stenosis, mechanical thrombectomy, re-stenosis, stenting, followed by yes, angioplasty. I think the entire you could run through the entire array of the treatment choices on a single patient. It's marvelous. So I should really congratulate you for that. I just want to see, in fact, uh, Minakshi, I would like to... Uh, so, as you see, there are this in this case, the intracranial atherosclerotic disease was found focally in only one, one arterial tent. The other vessels are fairly. Okay. I think what what it looks like is all other vessels are fairly well preserved. Is there any entity like focal ICAT? No, there is a chance. There is a chance that there was some embolus which got over from some place and went and sat there. That it would have been responsible for a focal appearing lesion. There could have been something else. The common sources could have been that is, that is the reason that Vazit Treddy was actually trying to see anticoagulation. So the point mm -hmm. is you have focal areas, for instance, from the arch of hiata and embolus lodges and goes away and then does this because antiplatelets are perhaps not going to take care of that mechanism which can be taken care of only by anticoagulation. What do you think, Sri? Was that possible? Sorry. Anna is asking that it was a only it a is... focal area of involvement. That means why it's still, was it coming from somewhere else? So this was something which we have been trying to evaluate and we couldn't get an answer. We ended up even doing a TE and a 72 hours halter monitoring yeah. to rule out a potential cardiomolic source. We couldn't find it out, so... Maybe well, the, the other, only thing... Other vessel imagings were done? So only thing which we had not done was a proper vessel wall imaging. We had only done the CT angio and the DSA maybe an IE resolution MR vessel wall imaging could have given a better idea if we are dealing with an alternative pathology. What is the COVID status? Sir, negative sir. Her antibody titers are positive but uh, she had vaccinated twice. And uh, there was no obvious symptomatic COVID infection. And, and I just wanted to know, ask you, what is the role of uh, 2A3B inhibitors in refractory post-mechanical thrombectomy, re -stenosis. What is the role of 2A3B inhibitors? Yes, sir. To be very honest, I was trying to find this answer. The recommendations, the guidelines in general gives an umbrella statement that there is no role for GP2B3A. But then most of the interventional neurologists, they end up giving uh, IV GP2B3A inhibitors immediately after an intracranial stent. But we don't have a robust experience to do so anything like that. Sir. There is one, I, 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 I don't know, I have read one, one uh, I think it's a Canadian paper where refractory mechanical thrombectomy. It's a case where they have used, a case series where they have tried uh, 2A3B inhibitors. I think it's worthwhile having a look at that. Yes, sir. And uh, they, they, they claim that it is fairly good in, in cases where 
there is a restenosis following a mechanical thrombectomy they have tried that almost the fairly a good statistically significant number of persons improved with that yes sir will do that sir and your excellent presentation sri very thank you sir very very excellent and i am my question from the chat box lot of lot of take home messages is there any questions in the question box yes one question is there what is the success rate of uh, thrombolysis the question has been asked see so you can take it or i can try to answer has so been a question for the chat okay now the data has come with you know with, with the, the exact data has been published actually with the alti plays earlier for you know patients spont- the, the the success is measured in terms of recanalization so around 25% is spontaneous recanalization 47% was quoted for alti plays alone and uh, on those days when the bridging therapy was actually going on the success rate was quoted with bridging that is intra arterial alone was 63% intra arterial plus bridging that was the bridging i i we followed by ia was around 67% you can see that there wasn't much difference between those intra arterial administration of tpa combined with bridging in those days and at that time was when mechanical thrombectomy was coming in using actually the first generation devices especially the mercy retriever and that was 83% recanalization and it was very well shown that recanalization was associated with success subsequently when tantiplase came in the comparison was made between tantiplase and altiplase and it was shown in a few studies that the recanalization rates for iv alone was much better with tantiplase and that is one of the success stories of tantiplase there have been many possible explanations given for that so we, this is the amount of recanalization we can expect and that should be the success rate in whole that should answer the question of the success rate of thrombolysis i think uh, the take home messages i would like to the uh, dr prashant is there uh, so, sir i am not doctor i am from mcor okay who, who is, is there any medical doctor dinesh uh, dr dinesh dr dinesh hello yes sir is it point yes, you know, what is the dose uh, which you have got approved right now with a because uh, you know that sir, the at our center uh, yes sir Uh, at our center, we are preferring point zero point two five mg per kg for tenic test. Ah, uh, that's why. In fact, I uh, uh, I I do not know. Mcur as a company, have you taken the approval for point two five, sir? Ah, uh, so sir, uh, to give clarity on this, sir, you know the DCGI has given us approval. Ah, uh, till sixty five kg, it is point two, and above sixty five kg, it is point two five. the maximum recommended dose for any patient even if it is 100 kg or beyond it is 20 mg so this is the approval status as far as the dosing is concerned sir you come out again you come out again uh, just not up, up to 65 kg it is 0.2 okay above 65 kg it is 0.25 maximum pers- permissible dose irrespective of weight will be point, uh, 20 mg uh, maximum dose okay Uh, I, so, I might want to add some correction to it sir, that uh, the maximum permissible dose earlier it was said to be 25 uh, mg which was included in the guidelines so i am not sure if 20 or 25 in fact uh, the, yeah that's the right. act yeah. data the act data from canada was 0.2 mg yeah. per kg body weight and it was actually maximum dose was 25 the dose escalation studies initially when they did 2009 that data 0.1, 0.2, whether it was not there, I am not sure. 0.4, and one more dose was there. Yeah. It was shown that 0.4 is actually harmful. Okay. And in fact, surprisingly, when you open up to date, you don't get any positive thing. The first thing they will reflect today, if you open up to date for thrombolysis, they will mention, be careful about using the antiplase. That's the way it will be worded. But after that, it will be shown that because 0.4 is not show response. I pointed out in the previous forum. We are using tantiplase quite freely. In fact, uh, so that is why it is differently yeah. worded. Yeah. In fact, Doctor Bijai, 
who is a primary principal investigator of the activists he gave a little, about a couple of weeks uh, mq had a meeting and he said 0.25 and 25 is that's what he said so remember the magic figure of 25 0.25 mg per kilogram body weight and the maximum ceiling of 25 that's what he said so i think uh, uh, mq should take up this uh, and to get the 25 mg ceiling as as quickly as possible and because now that there are any number of trials which have quoted this figure just have a okay so the okay. take home message is the 0.25 mg is a good dose the second thing is uh, the tenecti place works very well in acute ischemic stroke the third point is refractory restenosis or stent restenosis there is no clear guidelines lot of things have to lot of guideline I mean there is no clear guidelines for us and everybody is it's uh, the choice is in highly individualized four things always perseveration to the best possible treatment as what dr shivardhan has done ultimately done a cerebral angioplasty which has made the patient feel better is really appreciated thank you i think we should move on to the next case Yeah. Over to Dr. Dinesh. Uh, currently, sir, you know, as we are moving to second case, currently we have uh, 187 doctors live with us. Over to you, Dr. Dinesh. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, MQR for providing this platform to everyone across India. And there were excellent remarks by the moderators today. And it's always a great learning to be listening to Dr. Lakshmi Narayan sir and Dr. Manakshi Sundaram sir. Um, uh, I'll congratulate Dr. Shivardhan for such a great uh, management of the case. And uh, it's actually good to see that all the treatment options being offered to the patient. So uh, without wasting further time, I'll uh, start with my case. My case may not be as rare or uh, unique that... Uh, can cause trouble in the real life practice. Uh, it's rather very common uh, scenario that we see. Uh, it's actually a case of stroke in the young and our tenacious experience. Just that uh, for the last few years, we have something new as a risk factor for stroke, which is COVID, and that always needs a consideration. So that's my credential. Um, so starting with the first clinical vignette, uh, Mr. Uh, MWS, who is 40 years old male, Presented with sudden onset weakness in the left upper limb and lower limb with uh, facial division to the right at around 5.30 p.m. on the day of presentation. Patient was apparently all right before that when he developed the weakness. He did not have any history of COVID illness or he didn't really have any history of vaccination. Uh, because this case was in the midst of the COVID pandemic, it was technically challenging to be really uh, conducting the code fast in the emergency of Apollo because of the COVID restrictions. But the program was uh, conducted as usual. The patient was rushed to some nearby hospital where they did a CT head, which was apparently normal. Uh, so he was rushed back to Apollo Hospital. What we have started doing is there's a spoke and hub collaboration with the nearby hospitals. And the moment we recognize any patient who could benefit from endovascular uh, thrombectomy as well as the um, uh, thrombolysis, the helpline exists through which the nearby hospitals can call up the Apollo emergency and the code fast gets activated. Um, so the patient was immediately shifted to our hospital within span of 20 to 30 minutes. And on presentation, patient had left UM in seventh uh, cranial nopalsy. With that, he had left upper limb and lower limb uh, weakness to the grade of three to five with left plantar extensor. So immediate code fast was initiated and urgent MRI brain with MRI angiobrain and neck vessels was done. It showed that there was uh, restriction diffusion as uh, evident on the scan. The posterior limb of the internal capsule had restriction diffusion with reversal on the ADC. Uh, so we also did the MR angio as a part of our code force protocol. Um, now we have been uh, moving towards rapid AI and uh, we are incorporating the CT angio and CT perfusion scans in more patients. But um, this is uh, a last year's case and uh, the MR angio did not reveal any large vessel occlusion. The patient had a posterior limb uh, of internal capsule infarct, which was acute and uh, patient had reached to us within uh, less than 50 minutes. 
So uh, there was minimal door to needle time. If patients, all the uh, contraindications were uh, excluded and um, he was uh, thrombolyzed with IV tenectis of, uh, with the dose of 0.25 mg per kg after ruling out all the possible uh, contraindications. So he was monitored intensively in the ICU setup and after 24 hours, we repeated a CT which did not show any secondary bleed or no worsening was noted in the patient. In fact, on presentation, his NIHS score was around 8, which next day morning uh, came down to around 3. And uh, the Turico, uh, because it was a young patient, we had to go and do this whole work of for stroke in the young, uh, which did not reveal any significant abnormality as such. The eco was normal with no RWMS, no PAFOs, uh, bilateral carotid vertebral Doppler was normal, and patient was managed with dual antiplatelet, statins, IV fluids, and on support EBR. So, um, because it suggested that often the uh, in case of acute thrombosis, the hypercoagulant workup would not be as accurate. So we often prefer to do it after four to six weeks of the acute stroke. And we repeated it in the follow-up, which was including protein C, protein S, anti-thrombin 3 factor, v laden anti-cardiolipin IgGM, and lupus anticoagulant. They were all negative. Patients 24-hour holter monitoring did not reveal any arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation, no supraventricular ectopic activity. The uh, associated risk factors like the vitamin B12, vitamin D3, they were almost within normal range. DSH was normal, homocysteine, they were all almost normal. But one thing that we had started looking for was the COVID-19 antibodies. And even though patient had not received any vaccine, his COVID-19 antibodies were more than 400, which was significantly high. So uh, it could have been a case of COVID-associated hypercoagulability leading to a stroke. So we went ahead with the CT angio of the brain and neck vessels, uh, which really did not show any significant abnormality. Um, rest of the blood workup was also fine. So uh, within a span of two, three days, patients started showing significant improvement. By the time of discharge after five, six days, patient had uh, developed significant motor improvement uh, in the left upper limb and lower limb, and there was almost complete resolution of the left limb and facial palsy. So um, the aim of this case was to project that stroke in the young has added a new category for its management and uh, that could very well be the COVID-19 as one of the risk factors. What we proposed in this patient could have been a COVID-19 associated stroke because of the hypercoagulability. We had similar two or three such cases in which we could and which uh, we have submitted to the uh, Singapore uh, World Stroke Congress and it's been accepted. I'll be presenting those cases there. Uh, it's a case series of COVID-associated FFTs, which are free-floating thrombi, which cause the acute stroke. There's a very distinct mechanism. We had two patients who had developed, one patient had developed an ICA uh, free-floating thrombus and one patient had developed a vertebral artery free-floating thrombus. And their uh, presentations were varied. Their uh, overall management remained uh, quite good because in our experience, patients developing COVID free-floating thrombi, they were very uh, responsive to a thrombolysis with tenectase. Because of the lack of time, I couldn't include those cases, but um, I'll discuss them in the uh, first of Congress of Singapore. So just to throw light on those uh, FFTs, uh, as we can see in the ICA, there's a very nice thrombus, and we can see that there's a good amount of flow around the uh, thrombus, and that's why they're called free-floating ones. They are... Um, very, very friable. They have very high embolization potential and uh, they're often associated with thromba elsewhere in the body. Uh, we have had patients who had huge thromba in the IVC uh, and most of the other uh, arterial system. So um, what we have got is a comprehensive stroke care as we saw in the earlier case as well. You need to offer patients all sorts of possibilities, including the thrombolysis, mechanical thrombectomy and beyond. So, uh, But still, it remains very important that we should act very early and try and save the marginally perfused brain penumbra. As the trials have shown us that even if we can go ahead and thrombolyze up to 4.5 hours, but the earlier we do it, the better it is. 
Um, it's really good to see that over the last few decades, the basic project and other data suggest that thrombolysis, which was just around 2%, has grown up to uh, more than 12% uh, in overall uh, population. So while we run a code fast and manage acute stroke patient, we need to follow primum non nausher as well as primum non tardare. We need to be very accurate, but at the same time, we have to have uh, the speed to do the same. And that's what we've been trying to achieve. So uh, just to brief on this, we recently discussed about the ACT trial. I'll try and discuss a few slides of the same. Tenectis, we know uh, it's a modified version of the uh, previously available RTPA. At T and, and K sites, there's a, a different uh, genetically molecule, uh, genetical molecule at the same level, which gives it certain properties. Like um, Tenectis becomes 15-fold higher fibrin-specific. It has got 80-fold reduced affinity to the PAI1. And it's the most important of them all is the four-fold prolonged plasma half-life. Particularly in the era of COVID, as well as uh, when we have to consider the patient for mechanical thrombectomy, one cannot really rely on a one-hour infusion for thrombolysis. That is where uh, tenectase outscores everything else the most because it's got a very high uh, half-life compared to almost four times compared to the previous available options. So uh, why should we really go for it? It's very convenient to use almost a single bolus uh, within few seconds. One can give this thrombolysis therapy. It's very effective in the platelet-rich thrombi. Now, this particular part we have seen in our own experience that COVID-associated uh, thrombi, they are very vascular, uh, platelet-rich thrombi. They are not really the uh, resistant atherosclerotic thrombi. And uh, that's where tenectase outscores um, the other options. Minimized systemic plasminogen activation uh, associated uh, inhibition and it's got very high fibrin specificity. That's why it acts at the site where the fibrin has been active. It lacks any pro-coagulant uh, pro effect. So um, as we see, it's very easy to administer as it can be seen here. The Two major trials earlier were the Nortes trial, which was the Norwegian trial that showed that it had a good potential, but it did not really show any superiority. The better trials were the Extend 1 TNK, in which they tried to look at the subset of patients who were uh, undergoing mechanical thrombectomy, a bridging tenectase was studied. Then the TEST trial, these trials did show that it was non inferior in most of the primary outcomes. Uh, our national guidelines have included uh, within zero to three hours, they do suggest that it's a good option compared to the uh, IVTPA, even though these guidelines are expanding and I think even up to 4.5 hours or even beyond, we can consider tenectase as one of the good options. Uh, the same ASA has started suggesting that one can choose tenectase as IV single bolus, 0.25 mg per kg, and the maximum is 25 mg. Um, I've gone through most of the guidelines and the recent ones even state the same that the, as uh, sir has rightly pointed out, the magic number is 25, 0 0.25 mg per kg and the maximum is 25 mg. So um, that's becoming a good op uh, alternative, particularly in the era of stroke intervention. Um, as we were discussing and there was a question in the chat box that what's the benefit of all the uh, endovascular therapies and was the rate? Um, if you can look at the data right from 2014-15, uh, starting with Mr. Clean trial, coming up to the Dawn and Diffuse trial, the benefit has been constantly growing from 14% to 24% to 36% and even beyond. The um, overall result actually depends on the neurointerventionist, the skills of the interventionist, the uh, comprehensive stroke care center, the management, and the door-to-needle time. It's a whole team effort. The better equipped a center is, the better are the results. So uh, as, as rightly said, the Mercy, Penumbra, Solitaire, and Trivo, these are the all available options. We are moving towards more of Trivo and Solitaire devices. Um, the rapid AI system, which was used for the diffuse trial, um, we Apollo Delhi is trying to launch it and it's going to be functional within the next few weeks, um, through which we can do a CT and CT perfusion and know the exact amount of uh, the core infarct tissue versus the penumbra tissue. If that ratio is good, in previous trials, the uh, ratio of more than 1 as to 1.8 uh, 1 was considered good, uh, the patients did benefit with endovascular intervention. 
And um, even with a basic CT scan, a non-contrast CT head, we all know that aspect score has been a good uh, option, which uh, divides um, the brain tissue, the MCA uh, territory into 10 points with the peripheral uh, parts of M1, M2, M3 and higher up M4, M5, M6. And um, the mnemonic click for the uh, caudate nucleus, the uh, internal capsule, the um, lentiform nucleus, and the insular ribbon. So um, the ACT trial, as we discussed, Dr. Vijay Menon had been um, studying this part where they included the patients uh, from the Canadian Registry of Stroke. Um, they used the dose of 0.25 mg per kg. And uh, the question asked was, is tenectase non-inferior to alteplase? And the answer was much better. So uh, the trial was um, probe design blinded uh, in trial. They used two registries, the QICR and the optimized registry. The uh, inclusion criteria included patients with disabling deficits and less than 4.5 hours from the onset and the age of more than 18 years. So they divided roughly around 800 patients in each group and after exclusion, 790 uh, in the group of tenectes and 760 in the group of alteplase. So the primary outcome was uh, of the trial was to look at the MRS 0 to 1 at 90 day. And secondary outcome was functional MRS of 0 to 2 or the quality of life with the visual analog scale evaluation and uh, overall um, the uh, quality of life of the patient. Then they also looked at the safety outcomes in terms of mortality, symptomatic ICH, one particular uh, orolingual angioedema, which has been often reported uh, a rare complication, but it's been seen with alteplase, uh, was also studied. And they found out that it wasn't much. Um, to classify the ICH, they use the Heidelberg classification, which is pretty standard one with uh, classes from 1 to 3, HI1, HI2. And as we move from uh, 1 to 3, the severity of the um, hemorrhagic transformation increases. The MRS, we all know the, uh, 0 is what we want to achieve and 6 is the worst of it all. So based on this trial, the data suggested that the incidence of primary outcome was 38% in tenectase versus 35% in uh, alteplase group. So it did score over there. And if we go through the charts, as we can see in tenectase, it provided much better zero and one scores of MRS compared to alteplase. The same was the case uh, with secondary endpoints. At max, there was no significant difference. So it provided almost similar sort of secondary endpoints. And if we look at the analysis, the parameters, be it age, NIHSS, or the uh, door to needle time, everything did favor tenectase the most. So uh, at 90 days MRS, the anterior circulation LBO category, which is uh, the major part of it, because this category may often need uh, associated mechanical thrombectomy option to be provided always. In all these cases, it was significantly better. The tenectase did uh, overscore. Like if you can see in this chart, alteplase and tenectase, if there is no LVO, the efficacy is almost similar. But if there is a large vessel occlusion, the efficacy seems to be almost double in case of achieving MRS zero and uh, as good as uh, alteplase for MRS one. But that provides a very valid point for bridging with tenectase compared to uh, alteplase in patients who require uh, mechanical thrombectomy. So um, to conclude it, um, I think COVID is very important risk factor and um, it's still relevant and particularly in young cases or even the cases where uh, there's a free floating thrombus one can identify and tenectase is a very good thrombolytic agent it has definitely got greater ease of administration in a resource limited country like us with almost one third a cost of uh, alteplase it seems like a very lucrative option Tenectase is almost comparable in terms of uh, efficacy. Some of the recent data actually shows that this anterior circulation LVO, then it's even uh, more efficacious than alteplase. The magic number is 25. 0.25 mg per kg is the dose advised in most of the trials and 25 mg being the maximum of it all. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent presentation. We really enjoyed your uh, 
presentation and uh, in fact uh, the free floating thrombus is a very good take home message which i and the image which showed was also fantastic and uh, you highlighted us on the i have one question is a biosimilar tenecti place and the are they similar and what is the difference voice broke off and i have the uh, question repeated sir. okay can you can you hear me now yes sir like is a biosimilar tenecti tenecti place and the recombinant is there any difference I can't hear the audio if uh, someone can repeat the question for me. Just one minute, one minute, one minute. I'll see whether I can. His question is whether biosimilar yes. connective place and recombinant connective place are they same? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, because the connective has got three genetically modified sites at T, N, and K. It's it's uh, it's been shown to have a uh, better efficacy in terms of it's very fibrin specific and uh, particularly the part where uh, inhibition by PAI plasminogen activator inhibitor this uh, parameter it's it's much better handled by the genetically modified genetics providing it uh, a longer half life that's why it outscores. The question, sir, asked was. Connective place, yes, the original one and the biosimilar, are they same? Are they different? Is what sir is asking. Correct, Anna? Ah uh, yes. I just want to know. Or yeah. uh, the what is the, do we have both here in India? Sir, I think the one of which uh, MQ uh, comes up with a biosimilar. Do we have the original version? The combinant. The... See, no, I don't think so, sir. Not in India. Both are recombinant only. The biosimilar oh. have shown studies which have shown that the efficacy is completely equal. The DCGI has approved only our tenectase and not any other product as of now. Only thing is, and that was that is with MQ only, and no other you know product as of now has been approved by DCGA for use. And they, I am sure they have data. I have seen their data. Which showed that their product is the biosimilar product which they have is absolutely of the same efficacy as the original BI product. I stand clarified by the company people. Sir? Huh? Am I correct? Yeah. Prashant? Yes, sir. Would you like yes, to sir. respond? Yes, sir, Dr. Uh, uh, Minakshi Sundaram sir has already told the same thing, sir. We have done a direct head-to-head -head comparison study with uh, innovator product, BA uh, bioavailability and bioefficacy study, bioequivalence study. BA, BA study has been done, safety study based and is also been done as head-to-head -head comparison. And it is equivalent to innovator. As far as Indian regulatory status is concerned, sir, uh, tenecteplase 20 milligram by MQ with brand name tenectase is the only formulation which is approved in neurology. Earlier, BI, BI was having a brand of tenecteplase, but it was available and approved only for MI as the primary indication. And in my opinion, even the other tenecteplase which MQ has is not a, also, also not approved. Only tenectase has been approved. Am True. I correct, sir? Absolute right, sir. There was a question in the chat box about the duration of approval use, three hours. Can we use beyond three hours? The answer is yes, we can use beyond three hours. But whether there is a regulatory approval, as of now, it is still pending. It has been submitted in my opinion and it has to be you know, approved by the DCJ. But off-label, everyone is using, we are also using, that is the same story all over. We are bound by DCJ, we are not bound by FDA. We are not bound by Canadian study. Regulatory means it is three hours, but I am sure we can use beyond three hours up to 4.5 hours. And there was a recent Chinese paper that Chablis study which showed that if you have a diffusion perfusion mismatch, the usage can be extended even up to 24 hours with tenectomies. So this has been one of the recent data. Okay. I have certain doubts to ask regarding this question. If the course director permits me after this discussion, I may ask. 
in fact i just want to tell one thing to all the young neurologists the time has come for us to include and thrombolize as many cases as possible instead of looking reasons for exposure this is a very very important message i want to drive across all the young neurologists i draw your attention to one of the large study in the state of memphis and tennessee where they have taken they have they have gone beyond the guidelines what they have done is they have done an aggressive extended window thrombolysis extended window thrombectomy both just taking consent from the patients they have done more than more than 1000 1600 in one year where their symptomatic ich is less than what is quoted in the trial which is around 2 the the paper which is published in green journal it says that i symptomatic ich is 2% as against the 6% ich which was quoted in most of the other journals so i request all of you to be as aggressive as possible and all, all, all of you must be aware that the smart thrombectomy the smart thrombolysis has removed most of the contraindications which has been depicted before in the original trials those were the times when we were cautiously treading now the time has come where we have to run as fast as the cardiologist and make sure that time should not be far away where primary cerebral angioplasty or peripheral whatever invasive procedures should be in the hands of neurologists thank you there is another question in the chat box about fda approval for pantyplase in acute ischemic stroke i think uh, it's not yet been fda approved and uh, that's that's why the whole uh, discussion because uh, it's very uh, something ironical like uh, as i was listening to dr kameshwar prashad in one of his presentations uh, he he did uh, brief us about the history of tenecteplase and uh, in 2003 and 4 even tenecteplase got approved by the us fda but unfortunately not for the stroke only for the myocardial infarction or the mi uh, related thrombolysis then after that there has been a huge gap between the overall uh, us fda procedure and uh, real world approval for that um, maybe in coming few years i think mq people should be able to uh, help with the question and uh, it's still not approved but in next few years it's expected more than 75% of the countries it has been used presently in stroke more than 75% of the countries most of the european countries are using it canada is using it most of the uh, southeast asian countries have started using it so the i think i don't think the fda is not going to be a matter of concern because normally Uh, they take their own sweet time when it comes to molecules outside there okay sir actually even several hospitals in us i am told yes. they have switched completely to tenecte place they openly they have uh, presented saying that we are switched over so i think time has come for the change i have a question regarding the presentation may we ask that yeah please please go ahead the question which i have is that in this patient was there really a robust evidence for covid as a predisposing factor because the antibodies that were mentioned so we would like to know whether the patient was vaccinated number one and number two we always believe that the the antibody titers will be highest say about a few weeks to months after a covid vaccine and the titers have been followed up around 3 months is when they actually reach the maximum titers so in covid related stroke we have always seen the hypercoagulable state the thrombotic hyperthrombotic state was maximally reported in the first 3 weeks after covid really is there a link between these antibody titers which we have seen and the incidence of stroke so these are certain doubts which were lingering in my mind the speaker dr yes, dinesh sir could you clarify on these issues yes sir so thank you for the question actually uh, it's a very very valid question and that's what uh, was uh, 
the uh, area of concern for us as well because um, the patient did not really have a large vessel uh, free floating thrombus which is sort of very characteristic we even did a ct angio on the patient and uh, as you have rightly pointed out that the uh, patient who um, had a high antibody titer is likely to have uh, the stroke within uh, like probably after COVID, the risk is highest in the first three weeks. After that, if with such high antibody titer, it's very unlikely. Uh, the fact that it was a stroke in the young and uh, with all possible stroke in the young workup, um, there was no cause found uh, except for the high COVID titer. So it was postulated, is it associated with COVID and probably... Um, being um, a small vessel uh, occlusion sort of does not really favor the uh, COVID etiology. We wanted to go ahead and do the whole uh, trans-echocardial echography and um, the blackboard uh, vessel wall imaging uh, to look for uh, the CNS vasculitis as well as any uh, cardiac cause for it. But the patient was lost to follow up after a few months and uh, we couldn't complete the workup. That's why it uh, could not really be confirmed. <clears throat> And there was a guideline from our own societies. India made that guideline that the titers, the amount of titers is not a reflection of the severity of the disease. Does it hold true even now? Yes, sir. I think so, uh, sir. It, it, I think uh, it's, it's been very, the titer um, in some of the patients and even the doctors who got vaccinated because we all had this... Uh, query in the mind that if we should go for the third booster or not. So a lot of people did get the COVID antibodies done. And surprisingly, they had like in thousands, some of them had in two thousands, the titers were uh, shooting to the roof and uh, still it did not really lead to any of the uh, effects. In fact, uh, one of our uh, medical colleague, in fact, developed a GBS uh, secondary to a COVID vaccine and the titers were found to be in thousands for that uh, one particular case. So we did look into the literature, but so far there's no very uh, robust literature to suggest that a higher uh, titer would suggest a higher post-COVID neurological syndrome or associated stroke. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Minakshi, Minakshi, I just wanted to add only one thing. Uh, yes, I am, I am, I am in the national panel for adverse effects of uh, COVID vaccines. Okay. As well as in the... Uh, I have, to our knowledge, there is no correlation between the title and the clinical manifestations. No, Almost every case of uh, adverse effects across the country, we discuss we document and then uh, we we I, I ex exactly uh, code them and then uh, keep a record. So almost more than uh, more than thousand cases have been done. For each case, we go through yes. the entire panel. Will go through, but there is no definite correlation between the title and the title. Thank you. Thank you. Man. I think it's time that we. One question has come from the chat box that asks whether there is any difference in terms of efficacy, adverse effect, or any of those issues you may think of between 0.2 and 0.25 doses when it comes to connectiveness. One of the speakers could take the question and clarify for us, please. Is there any difference between 0.2 and 0.25? My, my take would be like uh, in the previous trials, which were the extend one TNK and the not S trial, um, they did look into the uh, different dosages of so 0.25 versus 0.2 versus 0.35 and 0.4 even. Um, in the subgroup analysis, it was found that 0.25 mg uh, had the best balance of uh, lesser symptomatic ICH on Heidelberg score as well as uh, equal efficacy to the uh, multiplace group. Um, the exact numbers I can't really quote now, but uh, the efficacy was uh, relatively, um, the primary endpoints were uh, relatively lesser achieved in point two, and the symptomatic ICH uh, was relatively more in the point zero four uh, group, uh, point four zero group. So uh, the balance that was being looked for was, uh, it did settle, the equilibrium was achieved at 0.25 mg dose.
Thank you. Thank you. I think we are nine seven nine six. Minat. Yeah. We hand over the mic to Prashant. Thank uh, you. Very much. Thank, thank you, Shri Vadan, and thank you, Dr. Dinesh, for wonderful presentations you, and putting up some novel points in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. You know, we have around 223 doctors across India who have joined for the evening, and uh, I am sure it was academic fished. The purpose of starting no thrombosis was to get challenging cases, difficult cases, clinical dilemma cases on board and get different clinical perspectives. So I am very thankful to each of the speakers for this evening, to really Dr. Dinesh Chaudhary and Dr. Srivartan for really getting your uh, uh, such difficult, challenging cases on board here. I would like to thank our moderator, Dr. Vidakshi Sundaram sir, for really enlightening us with his wisdom. And a special thanks to Dr. Lakshman Nirsaman sir for really getting time out and getting his uh, best of clinical pulse sharing with all audience. We thank each and one, all our audience who have joined for this evening and made the program success. Thank you very much. We'll meet once again this month with our next KT on 24th. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great time, sir. Thank you. Minakshi, thank you. Thank you very much, Nath. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dinesh, thank, you sir. thank you so much, sir. Thank you for wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye, sir. Thank you.